Administrator. Administrator. Kyle. I think we lost him. Not yet. It's science time. Now entering the facility. The Rings of Halo are arguably the most famous megastructures in all of science fiction. I'd be willing to bet that more of you know more about these than either Jupiter Brains or Dyson Spheres. Halo Rings are obviously popular because they're a part of one of the most popular and successful gaming franchises of all time, and they look awesome, but I like them for a different reason. I like Halo Rings for what we can learn from them and for their relative simplicity. And for their holographic girlfriends. And I like it holographic girlfriends, thanks for reminding them of that. A Halo Ring does one thing very well, and that's why I like it. Provide a livable surface through the simplest form and use of artificial gravity. And if you want to learn how to make gravity and how to therefore make a Halo Ring, we must begin our mission today with acceleration. Join me in the facility freight elevator, won't you? Just ignore the crates of laser weapons that I don't... <laughs> no matter where you are in the universe, inside of an active volcano, outside of a black hole, waiting for Kevin to get off the elevator, your mass remains the same. The same is not true, however, for your weight. Your weight is a force, and that force depends on how your velocity is changing. You can prove this pretty simply on an elevator. In my hand, I have a 10 pound weight, so you know exactly what it should be, and a scale at my feet. I'll bring these into the elevator, and then we shall descend into the facility cloning lab basement. Now I want you to watch what happens when we descend, when we accelerate away momentarily towards the basement and away from the scale. Now watch what happens when we go back up to command. You see, your weight depends on how you are moving. The scale is measuring a force, which is a product of your mass and the acceleration you are under. So if you manipulate acceleration, you can pretty easily generate artificial gravity. But master chiefing, if you will, gravity is something that isn't that easy if you don't know the math. So let's get to the math. And I know, I know, math is hard, but why don't we caffeinate up first, take a coffee break, and then we'll get right back to it. Oh, that's my stuff. <laughs> hey gamers, I'm award-winning science communicator and decaf Thor, Kyle Hill. You know, before I bring you the sciencyest, nerdiest, science that I can find in the known universe, I gotta start my day with a good cup of what you humans call coffee. That's why I'm proud to say the sponsor of today's episode is Cometeer. Cometeer is a brand new sustainable coffee brand that is convenient, brewed 10 times stronger than beans from a bag, and is delivered in recyclable, cryogenically temperatured aluminum capsules. Everything about it screams science, and it's science in fact that makes it such a great cup. After extracting all the sweet, sweet taste and flavor, Cometeer flash freezes your next cup of coffee to keep it fresh. Flash freezing, by the way, uses cryogenic temperatures to help keep ice crystals in organic materials small, which is good. And all you have to do afterwards is melt it. Or you could use the same 100% recyclable product to make an iced coffee by first melting the puck and then pouring it over ice to turn your taste buds into Bose-Einstein condensate of flavor. It makes sense. That's great tasting coffee at home with no mess or cleanup. You don't even need your own doer of liquid nitrogen. Cometeer doers it for you. <laughs> for a limited time, Cometeer has a special offer for fans of this channel which of course you are. Right now, you can get $20 off your first purchase using my purchase link below. That's 10 free capsules of coffee and always free shipping and always cryogenic and super cool. Sciency coffee. Had your coffee? Good. Now, despite everything we just said about mass and acceleration and weight, in the vacuum and void of space, 
you don't really feel your weight even if you're accelerating. No, you need something to get in your way, to act against your inertia, provide a force on you. For example, International Space Station astronauts only feel weightless because they're falling around the Earth in orbit at the exact same rate the International Space Station is falling away from them. If the International Space Station suddenly stopped orbiting and just stood there and hovered, then the astronauts would suddenly feel basically their Earth weight, about 90% of it. So I say that to say this, viewers, what would be an efficient way to get in the way of someone moving through space, accelerating through space, such that anywhere they moved on a surface, they would feel something like their weight? Well, maybe an object that's shaped like a sphere, right? Or a cross-section of that sphere, a ring. Now this is where the math comes in. I'll take it from here. <laughs> I always knew she was the best video game companion, companion girlfriend, wife. Partner. One of the easiest ways to create artificial gravity is to control a particle's acceleration while a circle gets in the way. In effect, moving that particle in a circle. A particle moving in a circle will always have a velocity tangent to that circle, with the resulting change in velocity, the acceleration, moving towards the center of the circle. But what will the acceleration be? Draw a circle and a particle. At every moment, the distance traveled will depend on the radius of the circle and the velocity. However, we can approximate the distance as a straight line when time is instantaneous. Now, everything is easier. Now, this distance traveled is related to the angle the particle makes with the circle and the radius. At the next instant, the velocity changes. The angle between these two instants also depends on this change. Two equations, both equal to the same angle, so we set them equal. Simplifying, don't worry, you can do this even if you are not an AI. We get the final equation. Thanks, Cortana. It's Aria. Right. Sorry. Centripetal acceleration that occurs during circular motion is equivalent to the square of the tangential velocity divided by the radius of that circle. We went through all of this math because we want to ensure that the acceleration inside of a halo ring and therefore the weight that someone feels inside of a halo ring is equivalent to the weight someone feels on Earth, to the acceleration that someone feels on Earth, 9.81 meters per second per second, owing to Earth's mass, what we denote as 1g. Using this 1g value and the equations we just worked out, we can pick the size of our halo ring, figure out how fast it has to spin, and then determine whether all of this makes sense in a non-fictional universe as this one is. Aria, ready the ship. No problem. No problem who? No problem, Master Chief. <laughs> da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. When building a halo ring, we have two what scientists call boundary conditions, values that we don't want to exceed for sure. The first is acceleration. If we make the acceleration much more than a multiple of 9.81 meters per second per second, more than 1g, then people will feel uncomfortable and their weight will be off and people will say, well, I'm, I'm not as heavy on this planet or this, we don't want that. The second boundary condition is that according to studies done by NASA, in similar situations to a spinning ring like this, humanoids start to get sick if that ring is spinning at more or around three revolutions per minute or RPM. So with these two boundary conditions, we get our centripetal acceleration equation. We plug in 9.81 meters per second. We plug in for the radius, a halo game canonical radius for one of the more modern halo rings of 5,000 kilometers, almost the same radius as planet Earth. And we get, if we solve for tangential velocity, seven kilometers per second, which I will argue is very fast. But if we convert this to revolutions per minute, because the radius is so dang large, we get RPMs of way less than three, way less than even one, which all means that the original Halo games size of a Halo ring makes sense. And that's great because then Master Chief wouldn't get like all woozy and sick on a halo ring, which is doubly good because he'd throw up into his helmet and he never takes it off and he'd be like, Okay, I'm probably getting ahead of myself.
However, a halo ring this size, the diameter of Earth spinning on its edge seven kilometers every second, would endure a tremendous amount of stress. So much stress, in fact, that no known material on Earth could keep this ring from shattering like a CDR inside of your desktop computer as you're burning MP3s onto it that you torrented from Kazaa. I wonder how many of you actually are old enough to get that reference. Thankfully, a halo ring doesn't need to be nearly this big. If you use the same math that we've been using all day, you can reduce the diameter of this ring by 5,000 times down to just two kilometers, and you still get a non-sickening RPM, you get one G of acceleration, and you get a tangential velocity that even plain old earth steel could handle. And a two, a, a two kilometer diameter ring. That's still impressive. I would not feel too guilty spark about it. <laughs> Cortana! It's Arya. Take us home. You see, this is what I love about Halo's rings. By trading a tremendous amount of mass and the gravity it provides for simple circular motion, you can create realistic artificial gravity that makes sense inside of your science fiction story without gravity plates or particles that don't exist or any other sci-fi nonsense. We wouldn't want any sci-fi nonsense in here, would we? <laughs> no, we wouldn't, my sentient AI girlfriend that I've emotionally bonded with in the absence of any real love or compassion that was bred out of me during my cold and genetically calculated Spartan career and training. <gasps> no, we wouldn't. Until next time, science spree. <laughs> Aria, oh, I'll try another one. Uh, Science-tacular. Uh, uh, Aria, did you think that was funny? Ar Science frenzy. No, it doesn't. Okay, fine. Thank you so much to... Ooh, that's good coffee. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for the direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. Today, especially, I want to recognize research assistant Stephen Purdy, who's very pretty, and visiting scholar Weightless up here, which makes sense for this episode. If you want to join the facility, if you want to drape on a silky white lab coat, get some coffee, talk to me every day in Discord, get episodes early, see behind the scenes photos, and get private members only live streams with yours truly. Not like that. You can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and join the facility today. And hey, if you support us just enough, get your name on Aria here each and every week. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of you. I have no idea how I'm gonna pass the time while all the... Why would a plasma grenade stick to somebody? I mean, I suppose, well, if plasma is effectively like superheated gas, then I guess a plasma grenade could stick to something like a Spartan's armor or other armor if that armor could be quickly melted by the superheated gas and then cooled such that it became the, the plastic or the polymer became kind of sticky. But to be able to control that kind of heating and cooling on a ball that's already heated up, and it doesn't stick to the Spartans' hands when they throw it and it's already hot, like, not everything in Halo has to make sense. I'd prefer if it, if it did. Thanks for watching. Kill s science. Kill si sp Double science. <laughs>